The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Thanks, everybody. Um, so as uh, was pointed out, I'm the manager. I don't claim to hack a lot of kernel code anymore. So um, I've got a team of folks uh, that pretty much just work on the kernel for Ubuntu. So um, to start off, I want to hit a couple things. One is, uh, by the agenda, what this talk is not, OK? I'm going to outline what we're not going to cover in this talk. Because uh, I've done these before, and they kind of get off in the weeds. So uh, I want to outline what we won't get into. Um, if people are interested in uh, deeper discussions, uh, we can set up a boff, and we can go over there and talk all you want. Um, I'll talk about the kernel team, the overview, how we're made up, what's the difference between canonical and what's the difference between the community aspect. Um, some of the kernel team responsibilities, what we do, what we're uh, charged with uh, handling and not doing. Uh, a little bit of the process and procedure. Uh, these are a lot of questions we get routinely. Why, why do you do this this way? Why do you do that that way? So I'll try to cover a lot of that. Um, what's different in the Ubuntu kernel from the mainline upstream Linux kernel? And uh, what's new in our upcoming release in October, Kermit Koala. And then at the end, we'll do some Q&A um, and go from there. So what this talk is not. Um, not a great session about your favorite Ubuntu bug or your Linux kernel bug. Um, we're not going to debate upstream topics or upstream technical decisions and, or a distro bashing session, because I've seen these devolve really quickly. And all distros are good. They all have their place. And you know we love everybody else. <laughs> so why this talk? It's really about transparency. Um, I came to Canonical about a year ago. And the kernel team wasn't very transparent in what they were doing. While we were a community distribution, and a lot of decisions um, were out there, nobody really understood how we came to those decisions, why we came to those decisions. Um, so we've done a lot of things uh, since I've been there to make it more open. Uh, we hold community RC meetings. Everything's done on our mailing list. So we've tried to open that process up, and we've tried to bring in um, outside contributors from the community. The kernel is a unique animal in that um, it's not like a lot of user space stuff where you get uh, contributors or drive-by people that you know throw a patch out at you to fix a bug. The kernel's pretty specialized and pretty deep, so a lot of contributors go upstream. They don't necessarily come to us and give us patches. They'll go up to the mainline Linux kernel, and we'll get those when we rebase on whatever version they roll back down. Um, we have a handful of community, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, that um, help us out and are really uh, quite valuable in the way our distros run, especially from the kernel side. So um, about the kernel team itself. So the kernel team is made up of three basic parts. We've got paid canonical employees, which I'm one of. Um, I manage these two bullets here, the top bullets, which are the Ubuntu platform developers. And there's nine of us there. And then we've got the canonical paid employees that work on contract work. These are the folks that you see enabling the Dell Mini 9s with Ubuntu, the HP Mini Me's and a lot of other things that are rebranded Ubuntu that you'll see uh, press about. You know, uh, For example, Acer did one that had all their branding, but it was Ubuntu under the covers. So that's the team that works on that half. And they feed their patches back to us that we roll out in uh, later Ubuntu releases. And then we've got the community contributors, which I talked a little bit about. So um, that's sort of how we're structured. A lot of people don't really understand that. They think it's just one big lump of people, and they all kind of do something. So that's our, our primary division. Um, we do a lot of hardware enablement for people, um, for Intel, for you know, a lot of the ODMs. And when we do that, um, a lot of this work is on device level things. So for example, um, we will enable for Intel a specific board. However, that board might be used in, a, let's say, a netbook later down the road. The second team, the partner contract guys, actually enable the device. So we, all the reference platform work is done in the Ubuntu platform team, where we're you know, taking, uh, for example, we're doing an ARM port. 
So we'll get the reference board from Freescale. We'll take that, enable it, make sure it boots, it works. And then when it actually shows up in a device by some manufacturer, the second team takes it and enables all the things that hang off it. All the webcams, the USB gizmos, the Bluetooth, because every vendor adds their own specialized chipsets and things like that. So that's how the division sort of works. So, um, like I said here, the platform, we enable reference platforms, and then the hardware enablement team does specific devices. The team, as, as you saw, is pretty big. It's almost 20 people. We'll probably be at 25 people by the end of the summer. Um, we're global across seven countries. Everybody's remote. Nobody's in an office. So um, it makes uh, coordinating that type of work very challenging. Uh, we use a lot of things, which I'll hit in a later slide, uh, that talks about how we communicate and how we try to keep that coordination together. So our community, we can consist of upstream developers. We have quite a few upstream kernel folks that act actively work in Launchpad, which is our bug tracking system. Uh, we have Ted So uh, from the Linux file system. He's in there working quite a bit. Um, in fact, we worked with him to solve an F-Sync bug um, here recently. Um, we've got um, Jesse Barnes from Intel, who's doing a lot of the X work. Uh, we've got all three major wireless upstream people working with us, John Linville, um, Johannes Berg, and Luis Rodriguez from Atheros are all working in our bug tracker. Um, they're tracking what we're doing. We're tracking what they're doing. We've got a real good collaboration back and forth. Um, and then we've got partners and vendors. We've got Intel. We've got Dell. We've got HP, Via, um, you name it. There, there's probably 25 or 30 partners that we work with um, that are all contributing. Um, and then we've got our volunteers. Uh, we've got volunteer developers. Uh, a couple of who are here today, Daniel Chen is one who does a lot of audio work for us. Uh, we've got a lot of testers. We've got bug triagers and a lot of people that just write documentation for us, especially around the kernel bits because they're so complicated. Um, like we'll throw out a wiki page with just brute force how to do something and they'll come along behind us and clean it up and make it much more useful for the, you know, the community at large. So our responsibilities. So there's a lot of bullets here. Um, and this is not all inclusive. This is just like the highlights. Um, you know, we get stuck with a lot of things. Um, a lot of bugs look like kernel initially, so we get barraged with a lot of things, and we find out later they're user space. But, um, you know, we're supposed to develop in an open and collaborative fashion, and we've really been stressing that over the last two cycles uh, through Intrepid and Jaunty and moving into Karmic. Um, our, pr our primary way of doing that, which is the last bullet there, is uh, UDS, our Ubuntu Developer Summit. So we get the community together, we try to do it in a very open fashion, we talk about what we're going to do, what the rationale is, why it makes sense to do that, and we take everybody's input and we come to a collective decision by the community, it's not just canonical. Uh, we have our interests and we have things that we want to do, but uh, we do take all the feedback from the community and factor that in and try to come up with a good um, middle ground for everybody. Um, we enable a wide range of hardware. Um, we've got uh, several data centers that have testing facilities where we do netbook testing. Uh, for example, on uh, Jaunty, we bought, we went out and bought a large number of the top five netbooks that were on the market. We bought those and we did nothing but just attack them from the enablement perspective to make sure everything worked or reasonably worked out of the box. And if they didn't, you had a documented workaround or a reason why and what you could do about it. Um, so we really concentrate a lot on the hardware aspect. Um, we have the, all the supported architectures. Uh, there's a slide later on that will outline what the architectures are and where they're supported and not supported. Uh, we set the development standards. Um, we try to do things as close as possible to the way the upstream Linux kernel works. So by that is we do everything on a mailing list. We have peer review of patches. Uh, same thing, for example, if Intel throws us a patch for a wireless driver, that patch goes through our review process, gets act or knacked based on the quality, what it's touching, what it's doing. If it's knacked, they take the patch back and rework it. So um, you know, we do a lot of things that way. 
Um, we have the care and feeding of the Colonel Git tree, which is public, uh, the mailing list, bug policies, documentation, um, which takes up a surprising amount of time. Um, it's probably equal to the time we spend on development. It's just in the housekeeping. Uh, we do vanilla Linux kernel builds and packaging. Um, I'll cover some of that later. Um, we've got uh, what version we pick for the releases. We do, uh, uh, we serve as the interface to the Linux kernel upstream. Um, I'm routinely in communication with numerous people uh, as well as members of my team working in the individual subsystems are uh, working there. We have our weekly RC meetings, we do roadmaps, uh, and we conduct and run tracks at UDS. So into the development, real quick. So this is our life cycle. Um, it's a circle, it's never ending. We're on a six month cycle. So um, right now we're in the, we're just starting. So we're in the, uh, actually we're in the second block there on the right, the open phase. We just had UDS uh, two weeks ago in Barcelona, Spain. We went through and laid everything out that we're gonna do for the release. And we have a method of doing that. It goes through a process called a blueprint and then into a formal spec that outlines the work, what packages are touched, uh, what other subsystems are involved, what other teams within Ubuntu would be in involved in that. We outline all the dependencies and then we proceed on the work. So we're in the open phase right now for Kermic, which is uh, we've already done the merge from Debian, uh, and we're in the process of adding the new experimental code, uh, and it's highly unstable. Um, it's equivalent to Fedora's Rawhide at this stage, where every day there's breakage, your, your machine may or may not boot, uh, X may or may not come up, uh, random crashes and hangs. So that is where uh, it's really ugly, and that's kind of where we're at right now. We move into the design phase, uh, which starts, I guess, um, um, I guess we're sort of, sort of in that now. A lot of these things kind of overlap. Um, and we move into the develop, where we're doing the active feature development, and we'll be there shortly. Specs were supposed to be completed by this last Friday, and we're starting to move into the actual implementation of all the different things that we're doing. Uh, then we move into test, and then we release and go into maintenance, and the cycle repeats itself. We do two UDSs a year, um, so we do them in uh, usually November, December, and then we do them again in uh, April, May, depending upon when the release <coughs> actually hits. So here's an example schedule. Um, so this was the 810 to the 904, so that was Intrepid to Jaunty. Uh, the A's along the center in yellow are the alpha releases, alpha one through six. We have a beta, and then we have a release candidate, um, which is, if nothing is wrong with the release candidate, it goes to the final release. Um, since I've been there, we only had one that didn't actually turn into it. We had a real bad uh, blocker bug in Intrepid, so we actually had a RC1 and then went into release, but that was just to stabilize. But you'll see, like, we go November to April. The alphas, starting with alpha two, are about every two weeks. Um, beta is two weeks off after alpha six, and then uh, the release is two weeks after beta. Um, and we do another interesting thing here, right around the alpha five time frame called a sprint. That's where um, Canonical gets all the uh, developers together. It's about 100 or so of the engineers. And we go somewhere, and we checkpoint on the release. So our last sprint for this cycle was in Berlin, and everybody got together and we spent a week going through the specs, finding out what was, what was blocking, what was late, what was gonna drop, uh, were we going to um, you know, maybe decrease functionality of some feature. Um, we don't slip releases ever. So we will always have a rollback plan on a feature to take it back to a known good state rather than slip the release for it. So that's why we have these intermediate checkpoints. Sure. Uh, very little, because the spec is highly detailed. So if you go uh, to blueprints.ubuntu.com and you can search on uh, Karmic, you'll get all the Karmic blueprints. I think there was like 378 for this release across seven teams. Um, and out of those, some are very minor, right? They're like, um, not contentious, real simple things like move this button here. But it has to be documented and why we're doing it. 
Uh, some are more in depth, like um, we're moving to Grub 2 off of Grub for the bootloader. So that is a huge undertaking because you have upgrade issues that you have to deal with. You have broken BIOSes that have to be found out and worked around. So that is a very detailed spec, um, several pages. So there, it all depends upon the level of the feature and what we're trying to do. Um, and feature is a really funny word in Ubuntu because we're not really developing a lot of things like from scratch development. It's mainly integration and um, bonding issues, trying to make two pieces go together seamlessly without a lot of issue. So um, that's what some people call it features. It, to me, it's really not, especially in the kernel space. We're not actively writing kernel code. We're doing bug fixing and we're doing a lot of integration work, making it work better with the distro, with the whole plumbing layer, you know, with uh, Dbus and HAL and UDEV and all the underlying stack underneath. So, but that's uh, the way a basic schedule looks. And then it just flips. So then you'll go from May to December, which is the cycle we're in right now. And it looks very similar. All the milestones line up just about the same weeks, just on the opposite end of the calendar. So this is uh, a sampling of the things that we talked about at this UDS for the Kermit kernel. So you see we had everything from bug, bug handling, right? We have the largest number of incoming bugs in the Ubuntu project in the kernel. And we don't fix very many of them. Because by the time we get into maintenance, which you'll see as part of our <coughs> update policy, we're not really fixing those bugs. We're moved on to the next release. Uh, we fix critical showstopper bugs and security, but we're not doing new hardware enablement. Uh, we're not doing anything that's not, wouldn't be considered a showstopper for somebody. Um, if, if it's a piece of hardware that doesn't work, we'll evaluate it, which gets into the second bullet, the hardware database. Um, you have the, the option as a Ubuntu user to submit your hardware info in, and we can actually look at that and say, let's say you've got an Intel 940 video card and it's giving you problems. We can go in the hardware database and say, oh, damn, there's 10,000 people with that card. We probably need to fix that bug. If there's five people using it, eh, probably not worth the effort. So that's what the hardware database workshop was about, was trying to figure out how to mine that data better and get it so we could make more intelligent decisions on how we focus our resource. Because we are a pretty small kernel team um, compared to some folks. Um, kernel config review. Uh, this is a contentious subject every cycle. Uh, the kernel has thousands of config options. What do you turn on? What do you turn off? Um, people expect certain things to be there. People want certain things to be there. And they may or may not make sense. Often things conflict. Turn, you turn one thing off, you have to turn something else off. You, you know, vice versa. So uh, we have a whole session about we go through our, well, we consider our key kernel config items and we run down those and there's a lot of things that we just turn off because the hardware is so old by this point we don't need it. It's not worth uh, turning it on and you know, potentially risking regressing people um, with newer, newer models. Uh, kernel mode setting we talked about, uh, having newer kernels on our long-term support releases, the LTS. Um, those stay in existence for five years and people want newer hardware on those. So can we bring newer kernels back? And what impact does that have on user space? What do we need to update? How can we do that reasonably without breaking things? That was a pretty good session we had. Uh, we reviewed non-upstream code. Um, there's a lot of things in the Ubuntu kernel previously that were not upstream. Uh, AUFS, AppArmor, I mean, the list is long and varied. So we went through and decided, what do we really need? Do we need a lot of this stuff? And we ended up, I think we got like 70% of it out because it wasn't needed. There was better functionality in the upstream kernel and we're migrating the rest of user space to use that. Um, our stable release update policy, we went over that. We had a, we tried an experiment for a couple releases and uh, which I'll cover in the SRU section. Uh, we talked about adding Android kernel components in the kernel. Uh, we have our kernel decision session which is uh, what kernel version we pick, what are the defaults. Um, so after we had the Grub2 session, we said, are we going to turn it on by default, yes or no? EXT4 on or off by default. All those type of things are decided in that session. 
Yes. Yeah, it was on, uh, it was available in Jaunty, but it wasn't a default. You had to manually say, I want ext4, but it will be the default. Uh, well, we won't, if you're on ext3, we won't upgrade you to it. But if it's a new install, you'll get it. Um, or unless you say, I don't want it. Uh, sponsoring staging drivers. So in the Lin Linus's tree, there's a directory called staging that Greg KH maintains, which is basically the dumping ground for a lot of drivers that nobody maintains anymore, but they, they're still useful to somebody. So he dumps them in this directory called staging, and in the hope that community people will come along and take an interest. It's a low barrier to kernel development. You can pick a driver. You might have the hardware for it. You can work on it and get it up to the kernel standards and get it into mainline. So there's a number of those drivers that we pull, especially for oddball wireless chipsets, um, the USB dongle cards, things like that, that we enable. So we picked a number of those that we're going to actively dedicate developers to fix up and get in the mainline kernel. Um, SSDs are really big now. So how do we make those operate better with Ubuntu? That was a huge session we had. And there's a lot of things um, that uh, SanDisk came in and talked to us about the low level, how their where, le where level algorithms work and why they do things the way they do. And we found about 15 things we can do in kernel and user space to increase performance by 20 to 30 percent on the average SSD. So it's things like when you format your file system, aligning block sizes so you're not getting half writes across blocks. Uh, adjusting the elevator to no op so it's not optimized for spinning media, it's optimized for so there's a lot of different things we can do. So we're going to auto-detect that and have the system tune if you've got an SSD. Uh, suspend resume is always a problem, as well as Wi-Fi. Um, every Linux distro suffers from this. Uh, it's just due to the varied manufacturers, hardware standards that are very subject to interpretation, uh, especially in the ACPI arena. So we talked about how we can do this better, what we learned out of the last testing cycle, how we can make it better, so we have a lot, of, a lot of things we cover in these sessions. And this is just a handful of what we covered. There was a lot more sessions. So when we communicate, these are our primary means. We use IRC, uh, Freenode. We have a public channel. Uh, we have our public mailing list. And then our weekly IRC team meeting. Um, you know, if you're interested at all in the kernel, I welcome you to come on by, join the mailing list. Um, you know, just say, hey, I want to help, and we'll We'll work with you. We have a mentoring program that we have. If you're somebody that wants to learn how to write kernel code or fix drivers or fix bugs, uh, we've got a lot of bugs that we kind of tag as ones that would be great entry level things for people to do. And we'll help you work on them and, and get them fixed and get your changes pushed upstream. So it takes us to kernel differences. Um, every distro has a unique problem in that you can't run a vanilla kernel. As much as everybody wants to, there's always distro integration patches that you have to carry for one reason or another. Um, we try to keep our delta very small from Linus's tree. Um, we call the differences in Ubuntu sauce patches. Um, they're special sauce that we add to you know, make Ubuntu work. So the differences really fall in integration patches, uh, support for live uh, CD file systems. We were carrying AUFS. Uh, which is a union-type file system, allows the live CD to work better. Um, in Karmic, we've dumped AUFS because it was rejected upstream for the third time. So we're going to move to the DM solution that uh, Fedora and SUSE use. Um, we carry the DSDT. Uh, that's a, it's a patch that allows you to override your BIOS from user space. So if you know you've got a buggy BIOS, you can actually write uh, BIOS code, compile it with the Intel BIOS compiler, and load it at boot time to override a lot of functions that the kernel will call. Uh, we have a lot of systems that um, we need to do that to make suspend resume work properly. They don't enumerate the ACPI tables properly. Uh, things aren't lo located where they're supposed to be by the standard. The Linux kernel chokes on it, and uh, a lot of manufacturers, Toshiba in particular, uh, writes their own DSDT that they distribute, and we put it in. Linus rejected the patch to do that, saying that you know, we should fix the kernel to deal with all these occurrences. The problem is the occurrences happen at such a rate that the kernel can't keep up. And this is just a stopgap workaround that we carry to try to make the user experience better. Um, 
we do limited backports of new drivers. So for example, uh, we're going to use 2631 for Karmic, which is now just the merge window just opened. There will be some drivers that will not thoroughly complete within that merge window. There will be features left out or there will be bugs that um, the upstream developers just say they're not going to fix in that series. We'll reach forward to the Linux next tree, which is the latest and greatest bleeding edge, and we'll pull those drivers with those fixes back into the 31 kernel and ship that. So that way the user has a better experience. Uh, we see that a lot with the wireless drivers and with the video drivers with for X. Um, and then we carry AppArmor and uh, we're going to be pushing AppArmor upstream. Um, Novell uh, let the AppArmor team go. They were the primary sponsor of it. Um, we hired a few of those guys and now they're going to take it and push it upstream and hopefully get it in. Um, from a technical perspective? Um, SE Linux is a role in type-based enforcement, uh, mandatory access control. AppArmor uses path-based. So uh, SE Linux looks inside at kernel objects and says you can or cannot do things with it, um, such as write to a file system or write to a file. Um, AppArmor does it by pathing. So it will look at the physical path um, or sim links and you know, uh, indirect them back and apply the controls that way. They achieve the same end, there's just how they go about it's different, and it's a very religious subject. Um, it's the VI versus Emacs, GNOME versus KDE, AppArmor versus SE Linux. They're all in the same light. Um, we chose it a long time ago, before I was there, um, because it's very simple to write the rules to lock the system down. SE Linux is notoriously complicated. Um, so it's, you know, it's six of one, half dozen the other. We chose it because it fit the Ubuntu model of being simple and allowing users to get the maximum benefit for the least amount of work they have to put into it. Um, and if you ever want to see what we're carrying that's different from the main line, if you look at our Git tree, it looks exactly like the upstream tree. The only difference is there's a directory called Ubuntu, and that's where all these patches live in various subdirectories under there. So it's very easy to find what the delta between Ubuntu and Upstream is. I think right now in Karmic we're carrying, I think, 24, 25 patches. Um, not very big. So um, when I first got here a year ago, we were at like 60. So we've pruned it down quite a bit. So here's some of the policies and things that we operate by, sort of like, you know, it's sort of like our, uh, our basic rules. So SRUs, they're equivalent to uh, Fedora or Red Hat Arata. They, there's a set of rules that govern what we can and can't put out. I talked a little bit before about an experiment we tried. So after Hardy, we really wanted to try to give the users the benefit of the Linux stable kernel, um, the stable updates that keep pouring out. Uh, Greg KH maintains that tree and he pours at a shot, anywhere between 80 and 120 patches out to the stable tree every round. And there's a lot of good stuff there that we thought our users could really benefit from. So we started taking those wholesale. We took them, they're supposedly tested and you know, signed off by everybody upstream. So we started putting those in Intrepid. It worked fine for the first couple updates and then we started getting regressions on current functionality. Uh, previously, our SRU policy was only critical bugs and security. So now we were taking any bug fix that came from upstream and applying it, and we were starting to regress users very badly. So we, after, we didn't know what it was going to be like. So we tried it. We found it didn't work the way we expected. So we're reverting, we're reverting back to our old policy, which is uh, for long-term support releases, we'll do hardware enablement for the first two years. And that's limited hardware enablement. Uh, it's minor PCIe updates. Uh, if it's a driver in by itself, an addition, there's no chance of regressing anybody else, no problem, we'll take it. If it's a major change to a, a very big driver, like maybe the 3965 wireless driver, we won't touch it. It's just too, too risky. Uh, and then, oh my god, kitten killer, uh, critical bugs, and security fixes. For the non-LTS releases, it's just critical bugs and security. 
So if you're wondering why you have a certain bug and we're not fixing it, the SRU policy is why. And that's the way all of Ubuntu is, not just the kernel. We made a modification, like I said, to, to see if we could get some more of that, those fixes in, and it was just too risky. Um, we release our SRUs quarterly, um, except security. They go out on an async basis. So as we get a CVE, um, they're usually embargoed till all the vendors can release on the same day, and then everybody kicks it out on the same day. So we try to operate as close to possible as upstream. That means our mailing list works the same way. You post patches, you do git pulls. So we have uh, a lot of people like uh, Daniel Chen maintains a lot of our sound. He has his own git tree. He'll send us a git pull. We'll go pull it right out of his tree and apply it. And the SHA-1s keep everything in line and we know where the patches came from and it makes life better. Um, we do patch review, patch submission works the same way. We make our partners go post it to our mailing list. You'll see Intel on there, you'll see uh, HP, you'll see everybody and their brother posting patches in there. Uh, Via drops by about once a release cycle to update their Chrome driver, the video driver. So um, you know we get, a, we get a lot of good people doing that on the list. So we try to keep it as close to the main line as possible. Um, it's less that the developers have to learn, worry about, deviate from. If they learn how upstream works or they're familiar with upstream, we're very much the same way. So this is like the various deviations in the kernel. This was the hardest thing I had, had to get my head around when I first came here. Um, I was used to, I worked at Red Hat before, <coughs> and it was basically one kernel, um, unless you had, uh, you were on RHEL and you got big mem, huge mem kernels and all this. We really have two types, a generic and a server. Um, for Hardy and back, we supported all those architectures, x86, x86-64, Power, Spark, HPPA, i64. It was a living nightmare. Um, we had a lot of patches for the odd architectures, like Spark, that would break the x86 build. And you'd have to resolve all this mass of architecture dependent issues to get a kernel out the door. It would take us weeks sometimes. Intrepid, you see we dropped it down to x86 and x86-64. We pushed all the architect, the odd architectures out to the community. They're called the ports tree. Um, we maintain the tree. We keep the git tree for everybody to make sure it doesn't collide with the main tree. Um, but it's maintained by strictly community members. They submit it to the build system and when it's ready, they assemble their own Ubuntu Spark distribution and put it out. Uh, Jaunty, we added the ARM architecture. Um, we've got uh, several contracts for various people uh, to do ARM work, uh, specifically netbook type things coming down the pipe. So the IMX51, uh, the IP4XX, that is the, uh, everybody's running one if you're running a Linksys router. That's that chip. So you can actually go and get Jaunty, uh, flash it onto your router and run Ubuntu on your router and configure it however you want to. Uh, and we have the versatile kernel, uh, which will basically give you a QM, QEMU operating environment to do dev work and testing. Uh, that requires its own special build. For Karmic, going forward, um, we still have the IMX51, and that will include the A and B revisions, which are the Babbage 1, 2, and 3 boards. Um, and then versatile, we drop the IP4XX. Um, the IP4XX is an ARM5 instruction set, which is nobody wants to use anymore. So all the new ones, uh, the IMX51 can do about four different instruction sets. All the vendors want to move to six and uh, it's ARM6 and ARM7. So the whole Karmic tree will be ARM6. Um, and then we have upstream mainline builds. These are not officially supported kernels and that if you find a bug in it, we're not going to take the bug report. Support, you can't pay canonical support to fix the bug. But there's a lot of folks that want to use plain vanilla kernels and mainly for testing. They want to be able to run the Ubuntu kernel, they find a bug, they'll grab the latest upstream kernel, vanilla kernel, run it. If the bug is there, they know it's a mainline bug, not an Ubuntu patch that caused the bug. So we have uh, a lot of mainline builds. They go all the way back to Hardy, and they're done on every RC release. 
from upstream. Um, so there's no sauce patches in the mainline builds. There, we use the Ubuntu config, and we don't build the supporting packages, LBM, LUM, or LRM. That's Linux backport modules, Linux update modules, and Linux restricted modules. And um, I'll get to those, I think, in a minute, if I recall correctly. And then we do the daily tip builds. So we take Linux's tree and we build it in an automated fashion into dev packages daily. And that's for people that really want to live on the bleeding edge. They want to track upstream, but they don't want to have the problem of building dev packages out of it every day. So again, no sauce, no Ubuntu config. Um, if you talk to any of the Ubuntu people about it, it's called crack of the day. So you'll see an IRC C-O-D, and that's what people are referring to. Have you tried COD to make sure that it's not there in referring to a bug? And again, we don't build any of the supporting packages. Oops. So um, LRM, this was a very contentious item for us. This was Linux restricted modules. This is where we put all the binary blobs. Uh, FGLRX, NVIDIA, uh, Broadcom's WL driver. Um, we removed it in Karmic. It's gone. We've moved everything into DKMS packages, and you only get it if you go in and select, I want the NVIDIA binary driver. Then it downloads it and gets it. So we are actively trying to remove as much binary junk from the distro as possible. Um, but we're not going to do it at the risk of regressing the users that are used to it. So that's why they're in DKMS packages. Um, for the FGLRX NVIDIA, there's the ATI driver, which has gained a lot of momentum upstream in being able to support 3D in ATI. Uh, we're actively contributing to that project and to the NVIDIA Nouveau project. So we're hoping at some point to actually not even have to offer those as an option if the upstream drivers can get in the right shape. So we've decided to invest some developer time and money in there and get it done. The WL driver from Broadcom, um, B44 is a reverse engineer driver, and it's just not up to par to deal with the Broadcom. And about 50% of the notebooks ship with Broadcom. Um, we've tried to talk to them. They're patently unhelpful. Um, they hide behind legal ease all the time. Uh, every time you talk to them about opening the driver, they're afraid of the FCC. They're afraid of getting sued. They're afraid of patent infringement. So we've pretty much given up on them. We have the driver there. It's there if you really want to use it. But um, it is what it is. I would just say buy a notebook without Broadcom. So what's in Karmic, the latest and greatest stuff? It'll be using the 2631 kernel, like I mentioned before. KMS will be the default. Uh, we've got a whitelist and blacklist of chips that are supported. Um, so you should be able to get KMS goodness out of the box. What that really buys you is flicker-free X from boot up. So you'll go into graphics mode from the time the kernel gets initialized. So you won't get that text mode flicker ka-chunking back and forth. It also eliminates a lot of uh, suspend and resume hangs. Um, probably about 20, 30 percent of suspend resume deal with uh, CHVT happenings in the X server and in the PM utils underneath. They switch X away so it can save state and throw you to a text console that's blank and then they throw you back. Well, a lot of times those all hit at the same time. X is trying to change while user space is trying to change and they're deadlocked on the semaphore and they just don't know it. And that's where you come, you can ping your box, it's alive, but you just have a black screen and you don't know why. Little blinking cursor in the upper left corner. If you've ever seen that, KMS will probably eliminate that problem for you because <coughs> you're not doing all the VT switching anymore. Uh, Grub2 by default. I think we're the first distro to go with Grub2 as the default. Um, this is mainly to support a new round of hardware from uh, various manufacturers uh, who I can't name that are going to be using EFI as their primary boot mechanism from now on. There is no more BIOS. So... Um, they do have a BIOS emulation mode, but it's freshly written. And I would rather go with Grub2 that's been out there longer than uh, somebody's BIOS emulation mode. So we've tested it on, I think, over 100 different models of notebook and desktop computers, and we've had no failures. So 
it's about on feature parity. It's missing a few things. Um, one of my guys, Colin King, is actively working on putting those features in with Grub Upstream. So hopefully it'll all be done um, before Karmic goes live. EXT4 will be the default. Um, and also, one, one other thing, if I back up for a moment, uh, Grub2, we won't upgrade your Grub if you're already running it. So if you're running Grub, that's great. A new install, you'll get Grub2. Uh, you still have the option to use Grub or Lilo through the installer if you want. Um, that We won't take that away. Actually, it was really easy. I'm running it on my notebook, uh, if anybody wants to see it. Um, basically, I apt get it a package, and it did all the magic. I ran update grub, and it was done. It was that simple. Um, App Armor, we're upstreaming in the dot .31 merge window. We're hoping to get that accepted. We've removed all the offending parts of the code in the VFS layer that um, people were objecting to, so it should go in. Sure. AUFS, um, it's a union-based file system that we use for the live CD. It basically allowed you to uh, use read-only media and write to temporary storage. So it looked like you were writing in the right places on the file system. Um, and we had a mechanism where you could use a USB key and allocate a certain amount of storage uh, to keep it like a computer on a, a stick. Um, AUFS just got rejected for the third time upstream. It looks like it does not have a future. Um, the upstream kernel community is very hard on union file systems. Uh, in fact, LWN had a big write-up uh, maybe a month ago on all the different ones and why they were evil. And so uh, there's the DM union mount that um, is currently in use by Fedora and SUSE. We're adopting the same mechanism. Um, it, our, the kernel team's point was we had to fix it up for every release. It was always broken. We'd rebase on a new kernel. We'd spend a week cleaning that code up just to get it to work, where if we stuck and put that same amount of resource in the upstream, we would make the upstream a lot better. So we're going to focus on upstream. So even if DM is block based, it's a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you can do snapshots and other things as well. So it has some other side effects. It's, a, it's slower. That's the main reason people don't like it. Um, but there's changes in 31 to it that should bring it up to par with uh, AUFS on speed. Um, we're adding Android kernel support in the kernel. Um, it won't be in the default Ubuntu kernel. That is, if you're running x86, you're not going to get uh, the Ubuntu bits in there. You'll have to get a special kernel with Android in it if you care to run it. Really what that gives you is the Android uh, Bender IPC mechanism that all the Android apps use to talk to each other. Um, we did a demo of uh, Ubuntu running Android at UDS, which I guess hit the various places across the net. Um, a couple of our engineers ported all the stuff over, and it runs on x86. Um, it's still a bit broken. There's no cursor. There's no mouse support. Um, it's all touch-based type stuff. Uh, <coughs> limited keyboard support, but uh, there's a lot of netbook vendors that are looking at it as an option, so we're looking at it just because it's something to do. Uh, it gives us flexibility. Uh, better Wi-Fi support. We're, um, at UDS, we had the three primary wireless maintainers, and we talked about ways to make this better, how we can help them uh, improve the code, improve testing. So we're going to go forward with a pretty aggressive plan on Wi-Fi, trying to get the drivers cleaned up and in shape, uh, doing the right things for things like suspend, resume, uh, you know, there's a lot of drivers have a lag time in association coming back. They're constantly rescanning, and so we're going to try to get a lot of these very um, leading edge patches into Karmic to make Wi-Fi wi wi better and flush it out. Uh, we're focusing again on suspend resume. It got a lot better this last release cycle. We learned a lot of things about how to test suspend resume, and we're going to take the lessons learned and try to make it yet one more time better. And we'll be doing the same round. We're buying the top 10 notebooks, the top 10 netbooks, and trying to enable those um, and make sure they work out of the box as expected. Um, and then we're, we've got the auto-tuning of SSD media, uh, which I said you can get some pretty significant speed, in, uh, speed improvements, especially on some of the cheaper SSD drives where um, they're not as fast as, like, Intel's got the fastest SSD out there now. 
Um, SanDisk has uh, their th third generation coming out at some point this year, uh, which will be about hard drive speed for both read and write. Um, but you're going to see a lot of these lower cost, smaller 32 to 64 gig SSD starting to hit the market as these new ones are coming out. And we want to make sure we're optimized to get the best performance possi as possible out of it. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time in auto-tuning. So that takes me to the end with questions. And this is usually the longest part. So, sure. <laughs> we, yeah, we work together on IRC pretty much. Like I said, we're across seven countries. Um, we've tried to do the hiring and division of people to match up with reasonable time zones. So, for example, that whole hardware enablement portion of my team is pretty much located in the Far East. I've got a manager that manages those guys, and they're pretty self-sustaining. Uh, once a month, they join our calls, and um, we collaborate back and forth. They're on the mailing list pushing patches back. But the rest of us are pretty much in North America and Europe. Um, the furthest in Europe, I think, is Finland, which is, what, UTC plus three, I think. So we can pretty much all line up in a day. Um, we're all remote, so we have pretty flexible work hours. Um, I usually work from 5 a.m. Eastern to about 3 p.m. Eastern which puts me in the bulk of the European time where a lot of my team is. Um, I've got a, quite a few guys in Portland, so they're on the far end of the spectrum. So, you know, it's, it's IRC and, and mailing list. You know, it's pretty much how we, we do it. Everybody works from home. Yeah, we have, uh, Canonical has four offices globally. We have one in uh, London, we have one in Taipei, we have one in Montreal, and one in Boston. So, and they're very small offices. Um, 20, less than 20 people in office. And most of those are really admin type, you know. The London office is the headquarters. That's all admin, HR, finance, you know, PR, marketing, all those guys. Um, the developers are all pretty much remote. So, yeah. It's, fun. it's a fun place to work, so. I think we're down to like four minutes or so. Any other questions? Right. Actually, it's quite the opposite. So ATI opened their code recently and pushed it all to the community for their legacy stuff. They only want to write drivers for their latest and greatest um, chipsets. Then once that becomes mainline or mainstreamed, it's popular. They're on to their next development. That their plan is to push that code back. So ATI has sort of gotten it, um, especially since uh, AMD acquired them. Um, AMD's very, been very open source friendly for a long time. Um, NVIDIA, like Broadcom, is the problem child. They, it's all reverse engineered. The Nouveau driver is actually surprisingly well. I saw uh, Bryce Harrington, who's our ex-maintainer, was showing me at UDS some of the stuff that the Nouveau driver could do. And I was, I was pretty impressed, given it's all reverse engineered and so let's say we're going to throw some resource at it and try to make it better. Um, you know, we want to get rid of as much as possible, get the binary stuff out of the disk drive. And that's really where we're trying to go. You say you're not going to support Broadcom on uh, Well, no, it's supported. It's there. You can use it. Um, we still package it up, but it's dkms which means um, it's outside the main kernel tree. And it will not be shipped on the CD in that what will happen is it will come up in 2D mode. It will say, hey, we found hardware that, you know, you could use this driver for. By the way, this is really evil software. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to use it? If you, say, <laughs> if you say yes, it will go out and download it. It will compile the shim because it's a two-piece thing. There's a binary blob and a shim layer to get around the GPL export symbol restriction. And it will compile the shim, load it up and then you've got it from that point on, unless you remove it. How badly or well are the binary drivers part of the scanner? Uh, they don't at all. That's why we're forcing the ATI and the Nouveau, because uh, in order to use KMS, you have to use GPL exported symbols, 
And once you do that, it creates a derivative work. And now you have to release the code. They're not going to release the code. And we're in this evil circle. So fun, fun. I think 30 seconds. One last question. Same version of GCC. Yes. Yep. And to build environments, for those of you that care, um, for the life of the product, we use the same GCC. We're not building old binaries with new GCC. We, whatever we shipped with and that release was built with, that's the GCC we use. Yep. Across the board. Yeah. Good deal? We're done? All right. Thanks, everybody. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.